we try and stay ahead of the curve and watch the trends. And we, we're, we're watching the states and the areas that people are moving to. Tons of people are moving to the Southeast. Even tons of people are moving around in the Midwest. And so we're watching all of that and we're watching the growing markets as well. Welcome to the Wealthy Mind podcast hosted by Alex Kolodinko and a good friend of mine, business partner Ashish Sanan. We are two immigrants who've come from humble beginnings to work in the Silicon Valley high-tech industry for many years, only to realize that we were trading our time for money on W-2 jobs in corporate America. Being laid off, downsized several times, watching our stock market portfolio lose significant value during each recession, paying high taxes was very frustrating, but we always knew there was a way out. Through a passionate belief in growth wealth mindset, we took massive action, started investing in commercial real estate and left our high-tech careers to build passive income with syndication investments. And now we help others like you to learn, grow and build life on your own terms. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Excited uh, to bring uh, a new speaker, uh, uh, Bryce Robertson. Uh, he is the CEO of uh, Cultivate Collective. And uh, we're going to talk about an interesting uh, uh, asset class, uh, which is mobile home parks that many people uh, probably don't know much about it. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome uh, Bryce to the show. And uh, Bryce, please introduce yourself and tell us how the heck did you get started uh, in real estate investing? G'day, Alex. Great to be here, mate. Yeah, Bryce Robertson, uh, born and raised in Australia, got to near the end of high school and realized I didn't want to do university. I wasn't vibing it. I wanted to go out and earn as much money as I could. But at the time, I had no business or entrepreneurship mentors. So I got a job um, as, as a steel fabricator welder, an apprenticeship, actually, because that's the highest paid job I thought I could get. I did a five-year apprenticeship in three years, and then I, I left Brisbane and went out to Western Australia and worked in the underground gold mines where you make the big bucks. Um, and I was basically paid for my time. I worked 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, eight weeks on, one week off. And I did that for about two years in Western Australia and Northern Territory. Then in my early 20s, <clears throat> I wanted to leave Australia and travel the world because I had a dream to travel the world for six years. And I did that. Here's how I did it. I started with my base camp in London, England, where I would work eight to 10 hours a day, five to seven days a week for like three months at a time, save up a chunk of money, go traveling for Europe until my money ran out. And then I would come back and work again and go to Africa. And I did the whole UK, Europe and Africa cycle for three years. Then I wanted to change the scenery. So I went over to a small ski village called Fernie in British Columbia, Canada. And I ended up spending two years out there. And uh, I originally went out there for snowboarding, but I found out they had some coal mines out there as well. So when I wasn't snowboarding, I was working in the coal mines or firefighting or downhill mountain biking or enjoying the outdoor activities. And because I was so engrossed with what was happening there, I, it enabled me to save up a bigger chunk of cash. And I stayed there pretty much for two years. I didn't really travel anywhere else. With that chunk of cash, it enabled me to go take a 18-month surfing and scuba diving trip down in Central and South America. And in the last six months of that surfing tour, that's when I met my wife, who's a native from California. And so about uh, 13 or 14 years ago, I ended up here in the States. And when I got here, I wanted to recreate this freedom lifestyle, but I wanted to do it this time, one, with my money not running out, and two, with my money actually growing uh, while I was while I was enjoying the fruits of life. Yeah, and, you know, real estate is a great vehicle. I think a lot of us, you know, uh, uh, picked real estate as a proven well-building vehicle to, to achieve financial uh, freedom. And uh, walk us through kind of an early uh, struggles. Did you start, uh, maybe uh, you were successful <laughs> right away, many uh, of us, you know, kind of start small, uh, either in a single family space, maybe on part-time basis. And, you know, kind of walk us through the journey. We all have stories to tell, but everybody has a fascinating story. So I would like to learn more ab about you, the early uh, beginnings of your real estate investing journey versus we're going to have a deeper dive of what you're doing now. Yeah, so in the beginning, I had shiny object syndrome. I wanted to do everything. I wanted to get... <laughs> I can relate to that. So 
I ended up doing about seven different side hustles. I was um, doing uh, working on for, foreign exchange trade market. Um, I was trying to fix and flip homes, do multi-level marketing, take over my father-in-law's construction business. And the whole list went on. I had about seven different side hustles and I was having zero success in all of it. And then I just realized, dude, I'm spinning plates and wasting my time. I need a laser focus on one thing. Right. So I had a I had a background in construction and construction management. So I knew it was going to be real estate, but what was I going to do in real estate? So I looked at all the different ways to make money, fix and flip, multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks, notes, like short term, long term. Like I looked at the whole kit and caboodle and over and over again, mobile home parks kept popping off the page. I get to contribute to the number one need of, in real estate in America, and that's the need for affordable housing. Uh, the supply and demand is very in favor of mobile home park owners because there is so much of a demand for affordable housing, excellent tax benefits, tons of upside, hardly any competition. I was all in. So um, I decided to put all of my eggs in one basket and I said no to everything else. I laser focused on mobile home parks. And three months later, I had my first mobile home park under contract. But at the time, I had a negative net worth only had $2,000 in the bank, which is enough to put an earnest money deposit down. And I had no credit because I hadn't been in America long enough to build credit. So that was my first experience of needing to raise capital and syndicate a deal. And then three months later, I ended up getting it across the finish line, got a couple of investors to join and figured out some creative financing through someone's retirement account. And uh, once I did that, I, I, I literally felt like I was 10 foot tall. And I'm like, if, if I can do that, like I could do anything in real estate. So, you know, my first mobile home park was a 40 space park. It was in um, California and uh, it was like $600,000 or just a little bit less. That was the park I just talked about. And then my next one was like a 200 space park. And then, you know, next thing you know, two and a half years later, I created financial freedom. Mm. Yeah, so I think that it's important to get started. And in the beginning, I, I remember also, it is scary. It is uncomfortable. And being able to take that fear and still make a calculated risk and step toward that uh, uh, direction of financial freedom is very important. A lot of people go through this sort of phase of paralysis analysis, the wait for the right deal, interest rates are too high, interest rates are too low, the competition, this and that. Uh, how are you able to overcome uh, that fear? I think in your case, you, you tried so many things. You probably failed many times as well. <laughs> That's why you took a leap of faith to say, you know, wh why, why not go into the direction? This is like a great question. And honestly, at the time, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, oh, if I had to try and think how I was going to solve all of the pieces of the problem, I probably would have taken myself out of the game. But all I did is I just thought about what's the next step. The next step is I need to get this thing under contract. So I just focused on getting it under contract. Once I got it under contract, the next step was to do some due diligence and find out if it's actually a good deal. Great, it's a good deal. Then the next step was like, oh, I have to get a loan. Oh, I have to raise capital. And I just did it piece by piece. And I didn't think any more than one step ahead. Hmm. Uh, if I had have tried to sit back and, and figure out how I was going to do it, I would have taken myself out. And Something to add too is I had paid $30,000 on credit cards. It was actually $36,000 on credit cards to get a real estate mentor. Mm, and I called, I called him up and I said, hey, dude, I've got this deal. I want to put it on a contract. I have a negative net worth, $2,000 in the bank and unseasoned credit, but I know I can get this done. He told me, you're dreaming, kiddo. You're never going to do it. It's not going to happen. Just come back to the club and do some single family homes like everybody else. You're out of your league. And so that honestly just motivated me. It, I hung up on the phone and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not calling that guy. It's he's not, he's not serving me to where I want to go. Hmm. And it gave me extra steam to be like, not only did I want to solve this, I wanted to be like, yeah, I'll show him I can do it. You know? So it was actually, it was $36,000 well spent because it motivated me to um, achieve the unachievable. Mm, to prove to prove him wrong and probably many other people <laughs> along the way, we all have different uh, motivations. 
But l l l let's go back to uh, uh, for for a moment uh, uh, before you even got to mobile home parks. You probably evaluated other asset classes, right? You, you did fix and flips. Uh, you probably looked at the multifamily. You know, there's industrial, there's medical offices. What was so different about mobile home parks that kind of attracted your interest and you decided to focus on one thing? Yeah, so I tried to do a lot of other things and I don't even like using the word try because we either do something or we don't do it, but I didn't do other things. I was attempting to do fix and flips. I was attempting to do some multifamily and uh, I realized that once I laser focused on mobile home parks, it was a big enough challenge for me. You know, it just wasn't enticing to do a single family deal. I just knew I could do something bigger and better, something more exciting, a bigger challenge. That was definitely very exciting to me. Plus, I wanted to be in an asset class where there wasn't much competition. I was putting lots of offers in in Southern California to buy, you know, fix and flip properties. And there was like 25, 30 people bidding on the same property and it was a price war. I'm and I didn't want to be in that environment. I wanted to be in an environment where maybe there's one or two of us or maybe there's nobody. It's just us. And um, so I really liked that piece, like not much competition. And even still now, and I've been doing this full time for nine years now, there's very little competition, especially in the niche that we have. Plus, mobile home parks um, have really incredible tax benefits. We do cost segregation studies at our properties as soon as we take over. And we give that study to our CPA. He adds it to our tax return for the first year. And that our investors get, you know, anywhere from half to all of the money that they invested back in tax benefits in year one, just because uh, we went and spent $5,000 and did a cost segregation study. And so that's really great. Um, also, you know, even now today, we're buying properties as low as 50% occupied, like half full. Even those properties that we buy and ones that are more occupied, cash flowing straight out of the gate. So we don't have to wait to send distributions to investors. We can hit the ground running and we can pay our distributions to investors. And there's tons of upside in filling the lots and filling the homes. And that's what we specialize in. Um, also, you know, getting to solve America's number one problem in real estate, and that's the need for affordable housing. That is no underestimated um, statement. Like mobile home parks currently, there's about 40, maybe 45,000 mobile home parks nationwide. And there's arguably about a fifth of Americans that need affordable housing. When you do the math, Mobile home parks are the number one contributor to solving the affordable housing problem. But by math alone, mobile home parks can't solve the problem. It's that big of a problem. So um, until that problem gets solved, um, as long as we buy a mobile home park in the right market that has a need for affordable housing, uh, filling the homes is is it's it's almost ridiculous. Some of our parks have a waiting list of up to 80 people who are pre-screened and pre-qualified, and we literally can't bring homes in quick enough to fill it up. Um, so we're really on the right side of the supply and demand, which is really good in business, but also we're getting to help America's um, you know, lower income and lower demographics. And so, and I mean the list could go on. I could talk about all the benefits for a real <laughs> The, 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 this is interesting. Obviously, I, I learned a lot, uh, just what you just mentioned, you know, from a, a, a competition point of view, it's 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 a niche type of investment uh, asset class, right? I mean, multifamily and single family homes, these are probably your go-to uh, asset classes that many people know when they're starting out. But when you start to create kind of your own lane, you need to figure out, is this the direction that you want to go or, uh, or maybe pivot into s something else. So maybe walk us through your typical, uh, uh, your mobile home parks as far as uh, the deal and the investment. You know, perhaps you 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 take us uh, through a journey of you know how do you find deals? What kind of uh, uh, allocations are these? Who who are the typical tenants are? What's your typical business plan? Uh, so that we we learn a little bit about uh, uh, the particularities of the deal. 
Yeah, so we've got a whole acquisitions team that's working on our acquisitions. We do mailers and cold calling. But honestly, where we get most of our deals from today is we're off brokers because not only is mobile home parks a unique asset class with not much competition, we also specialize in buying 50% occupied properties at a, at a large scale. So we're actually targeting 500 spaces to 1,000 space portfolios in singular acquisitions. And so we're talking about like 30 to 50 to $80 million in acquisition value. And when we do that, we're playing at a level that guys that can bring to the table and do those deals, they don't want to buy a 50% occupied property. They want to buy a 95, 98, 100% occupied property and not do much work. There's a lot of work in what we do. So because there's a lot of work in what we do, we have our own in-house property management company, asset management company, construction company, and mobile home financing as well so that we can control the economy of getting it from 50% occupied to 100% occupied as soon as humanly possible. And our basic business plan revolving around that is we buy at 50% occupied, do all of the construction, get it up to 100% occupied by remodeling a bunch of vacant homes that are already sitting there and bringing in a bunch of new homes on vacant lots. And then once we get it to 80, 100% occupied, uh, we refinance, uh, return original capital to investors. And then they're, they're basically very risk-free uh, in the deal. And then they get to stay in the deal for the remainder of the five-year hold period. And that's our general business plan. We also do go out and we buy some properties that are about 70 to 80% occupied. In those circumstances, we usually don't do a refinance. We usually just hold the property for five years and um, but they're basically the two different business models that we've got there. And, you know, we've we've been focusing in the past, we probably spend between about a two and a half to three and a half star parks. And I'm talking about like a quality level out of five star being the top. And recently, most of our communities have been, um, you know, high threes and low fours on the, on the star rating. So we're starting to buy nicer quality assets in nicer markets. We're building like a strong reputation in the in the marketplace. And but, you know, regardless, it's people who have a need for affordable housing. And, um, you know, some of our communities might even have attorneys and, and different professionals in there as well. But the common story at every mobile home park, no where it's located, is everybody has a need for affordable housing. And we do our best to provide the highest quality mobile homes and communities in the market. So it's a absolute no brainer to come and live in our community. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing. So can, can you tell us a little bit more about you know, particular maybe uh, geographic locations and, and, and uh, also demographics? You know, who, wh what is yeah. the tenant based? Do they not like apartments? Do they not like single family homes? Do, can they not afford those? Or is, yeah. there, is it their preference to have a mobile home park space, maybe with a, a, a more outdoor space? Yeah, so geographically, so if we're talking about multifamily apartments, most operators would just choose one or two large MSAs and just go deep because there's a lot of apartments there. But again, there's only about 40,000 mobile home parks in the entire of America. So there's really not that much in each market. So as operators in the mobile home park space, instead of us picking an MSA, we pick a geographical region. And so we're in the Southeast and we're also in the Midwest as well. They're the two main areas that we actually buy parks in. And we and we aim to buy them in the largest MSAs that are in the uh, Midwest and in the Southeast. And we're starting to build a really good footprint. Um, but what we're, what we're actually looking for <clears throat> as far as the demographics go is we want to test the market to know if it has a need for affordable housing. So we want to see that single family median house pricing is at about $120,000 um, uh, or above. And that means that there's a pretty big gap in between someone paying rent for a mobile home and someone being able to qualify for a single family home in that market. Um, we also like to see a 1.5 times multiple on 
what it costs to live in a mobile home park compared to what it costs to live in an apartment in the same market. So if they're paying like $500 a month to stay in the mobile home community, we would want to see that it's at least $750 to stay in the apartments. That's it. That means that they would have to increase their rents by 50% to go and stay in apartments. That's a big gap. There's a yeah. need for affordable housing in that market. So, you know, we do we do those checks and then we we check and test all of the other mobile home parks in the market to find out where the rents are. And then um, we actually, you know, find out how much their demand there is by placing ads out there as well. And then we really know like how much demand there is for affordable housing in the market. So they're the main things we look for at the tenant. On the actual city level, we want to see that the actual city itself has at least 30,000 people and the metro has at least 100,000 people. That's for two reasons. We need to have enough tenants to be able to fill the vacant homes and vacant lots. The other reason is, is uh, we need to employ contractors into our construction company in the local area. And if we don't have enough contractors to be able to pull from to get the job done, that's usually the harder of the two pieces. So we, we like to try and be in like, you know, decent markets in, in the Southeast and Midwest. Mm -hmm. And what, who are your typical tenants, uh, I guess? Are these blue collars you mentioned, you know, even some some uh, 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 white collar like attorneys and stuff? Is it just varies uh, from the uh, uh, lo location plus the, the type? Maybe there's A class, B class, C class, right? Yeah, so... We kind of have a variation. It depends on the market. It also depends on the size of the home. If we have a one bedroom home, we usually have single people or just a couple and they don't stay as long as people who, if we have a three bedroom home, we usually have a family, the kids go to school, they work in the local area. Usually they're more sticky tenants. Um, we have people on Section 8 in some of our mobile homes and on government subsidies and um, different uh, government plans all the way through to like, um, you know, local service workers, people working at local factories, blue collared workers, and then all the way up into like white collared and attorneys and, and across the board. And really, it depends on the market, depends on how close we are to downtown depends on the demographics of the area and the size of the homes but the size of the home is probably the biggest variable we we like to have larger homes it's um we we fit families in there and um yes yeah, so they're usually the better communities uh, and when you evaluate uh, th these uh, locations what are your sort of deciding factors uh, uh, you know in multifamily typically it's been the jobs right if there's enough jobs in the MSA that means people will be able to afford rents, right? In your case, do you go through the same sort of uh, analysis, uh, obviously on top of, you know, other amenities, uh, you know, proximities to uh, uh, restaurants, uh, shops, and ultimately the job is probably one of the most deciding factor, is it not? Yes. Well, I would say the biggest the biggest determining factor is how much demand we have when we place our ads out there for vacant homes. And that that lets us know how much demand is there. We do want to feel good about the uh, economy of the area. We'd like to see that it's a growing market. We, we certainly love it when we know large employers have just moved in and they're bringing in jobs. Or maybe there's some flagships like um, government uh, projects and state projects, hospitals, um, even in some markets, military, although, you know, military is a little bit roll the dice because they do close down some military places as well. Um, but we like to look in and know that there's a handful of, of good employers in the area for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but we also want to know how much demand there is in that market and how much there is a need for affordable housing. The other thing we look at is I actually study macroeconomics. So I'm looking at the great American migration. We're not in a time anymore where people necessarily have to work at the place that they live. A lot of people can work virtually. And so we're seeing people move to different areas and migrate to different areas for different reasons. And so we try and stay ahead of the curve and watch the trends. And we, we're, we're watching the states and the areas that people are moving to. Tons of people are moving to the Southeast. Even tons of people are moving around in the Midwest. And so we're watching all of that and we're watching the growing markets as well. Yeah, my migration is is, is very important. Uh, so, uh, as a passive investors, uh, uh, 
uh, I, I personally invested in a lot of uh, industrial, uh, uh, mo for the most part, uh, primarily multifamily space, because this is what I have known. Right, and I've done some, you know, multifamily. Uh, in addition to a medical office uh, space, uh, uh, storages. But uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, as a passive investor, when they evaluate, you know, different uh, uh, investment opportunities, primarily probably multifamily. Let's just compare that for the sake of uh, uh, this exercise. Is what are the major differences as a passive investor? Uh, that uh, they should be evaluating when they compare different deals. Obviously, there's some similarities, uh, but there's major differences. W what are these major differences uh, between multifamily? And mobile home parks? Yes. Yeah, so I would say the tax treatment is more favorable. So we have a, a lot quicker write-offs for the tax. So that's a really cool benefit. Uh, also, I think the recession resistance is significantly stronger in the mobile home park space. So if things happen economically and there's a downturn and people have to downsize and people are getting laid off and people are closing businesses, what happens economically is people downsize in their housing. They go from more expensive housing to maybe A-class apartments and they go from A-class to B-class, B-class to C-class, probably C-class to a mobile home park. They probably wouldn't go to a D-class, some would, but, and then you got to think about it, like what's below a mobile home park? Well, you're either living with your family or like renting a room somewhere or you're living in your car or you're homeless. It's it's some of the most affordable housing in a, in America. And the, the, the supply and demand is so in favor for mobile home park owners that there really is a strong amount of recession resistance, which I think is very, very important where we are economically right now and where I believe we're heading into in the next two to five years. So that's a really cool benefit. Another one is if... If we have apartments, let's say we have a hundred spare, a hundred unit apartment building. Well, if we want to add on twenty additional apartment units, we have to spend the money to get all of that constructed, and do we have to get through city approvals? This whole it's a long process and it's expensive process. And then there's upside but with mobile home parks. We can go in, we can buy. So let's say we buy uh, a 200 space mobile home park. Like this is actually what we're doing right now. Um, we have about 100 spaces that are occupied and rented. We have about 50 vacant homes. And we have about 50 vacant lots. All we have to do is go in and remodel those vacant homes. We can do about seven homes per community per month with our construction crews. And then one month later, they're rented. And then we just increased the value of our property by 70,000, sorry, 50,000 to $75,000 per lot. And we just, we do that by 50 over a couple of months. We just massively increased the value and forced the appreciation of the property. And we have a lot more control, a lot more flexibility, a lot more pound for pound upside for how much we have to spend to how much we can gain in doing that in the mobile home park space. And that's why today in today's market, we can buy 50% occupied properties, cash flow straight out of the gate, and then get to 100% um, occupied in like 18 to 24 months. And it's it's just, it's a really profitable game where we feel like we can still um, bring to the table attractive investments for investors of what they're looking for. Uh, we don't have to diminish any of the returns that we're, that we're providing. This is what we've been doing historically. And um, yeah, we can we can do that in today's market while interest rates are increasing, while a lot of other operators are holding off on distributions, we're still paying them out. And uh, yeah, obviously past performance cannot uh, guarantee sure. future performance. And I'm not making any like definite statements here or anything like that. I'm just telling you what we've done in the past. Um, but yeah, we, no, this, we, is, we love this, 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 this is good. That these are the major things. That from even from the tax perspective, I didn't know that uh, mobile home parks could do more uh, uh, than, than uh, multifamily. What are the risks uh, that should investors uh, know about? Obviously, there is no risk-free <laughs> investment. Uh, uh, can you maybe just highlight certain things that uh, when people evaluate deals, they'll say, "Well." I didn't think from that point of view and I need to pay attention and, and, and get more clarity. You know, in a multifamily space, you know, it's been uh, bridge loans, right? The, the, some of these loans have gone up so high that a lot of people either didn't have a rate cap 
or didn't think that it would go that high. They didn't have enough reserves. So can, can you maybe just highlight a couple of risks as a passive investor that you should be aware of when you evaluate uh, the deal? Yeah, I think the number one risk is the operator who's actually managing the investment. And um, I like to personally put most of my decision-making power in who's going to manage it because someone who's not a good operator can take a really good quality asset and drive it into the ground. But someone who is a really good operator can take an average investment and make it perform really well and run like a smooth old machine. So I think the actual the operator is the most important part. Looking at the actual project level, um, I think if we have communities that have uh, no privately owned utilities or relatively risk-free privately owned utilities like septic systems and uh, water wells, that's fine. But once you get into electric systems, gas systems, lagoons, you know, if something goes wrong with those systems, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of, of risk and liability. So we like to stay away from those deals. Or if we did bring those deals to the table, we would drop the purchase price according to the uh, risk that was involved there. But currently, unfortunately, all we have for private utilities is septic and uh, we may have a couple of water wells. So we're not we don't really play in that game. One thing that I think is, um, you know, probably the riskiest thing that has some of the biggest question marks is our economy. And so the way we get around that, because we think interest rates are probably going to go up, cap rates might go up, um, construction timelines might take longer, um, staffing might be a problem, property taxes might go up. So the way that we get around this is when we, we send out projections to investors, we're building in uh, the ability to have a 2% increase in interest rates between now and the refinance. We're building in uh, the ability to have a 2% cap rate increase between now and the refinance, a 3% cap rate increase between now and the end of the five-year business plan. We double our construction timelines, which means if we say we're going to um, refinance over here at the three-year mark, in all likelihood, based off our history, we're probably going to refinance at about 18 to 24 months. But we like to have that extra wibble room in case of supply chain issues, staffing issues, city delays, things that are out of our control. So we build these into our underwriting. We also double our um, property taxes, even though nobody has said they're going to increase property taxes. All of this money printing is going to ha has been happening, has to be paid back by somebody, gets paid back by the people through form of taxation. Price inflation is a form of taxation. Property taxes, capital gains and things like this are also other forms of taxation, which they may might start coming for in the next five years. Um, also, we're increasing our rents about 10 to 20 percent year on year right now. In most of our markets, yet we only um, project to raise our rents about 5% a year, just in case rent controls come in, which could happen in a bunch of states, or in case the market slows down and rent increases don't happen as rapidly. And uh, we have a whole variety of things like this that we add to our deal. So we feel like if all of the probabilities and possibilities of things that could happen economically happen through our hold period, we want to feel comfortable that not only we can weather the storm, that we can actually thrive through the storm as well. No, th this is good. Th thank you so much. Well, I, I learned a lot uh, quite today. And uh, so our, our listeners, thank you so much for uh, jumping in and sharing more information about this uh, interesting uh, asset class. How can uh, listeners get in touch with you, Braves? Yeah, the best way is to reach out is to go to investcultivate.com. And cultivate is spelt with the number eight. So it's C-U-L-T-I-V eight dot com. And uh, we can take it from there. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. We'll talk soon. Bye. Beautiful. Cheers, Alex. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Wealthy Mind podcast. We hope the content today filled your mind and your heart with the desire to build the life you deserve. If you haven't done so already, Please do us a favor and kindly like and subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future impactful episodes. If you like what you heard and want to see more Wealthy Mind content and be notified about upcoming passive investment opportunities, please visit our website at www.wealthymindinvestments.com and join our investor club. You can also follow us on social media channels as we are on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Thank you for your time and happy investing.